Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Addiction Hope webinar. We're so excited that you could be with us. And we have as our featured special guest tonight, Mr. Brian Cuban. Welcome, Brian. We're so happy to have you. It's such a privilege um, that you could join us again. I know we've had you in the past, and we always have great conversations. So thank you for being with us tonight. Oh, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be. It's a pleasure to be here talking about this. Thank you. And we are going to be chatting with Brian about his new book that um, was recently released, which is called The Addictive Lawyer, Tales of the Bar, Booze Blow, and Redemption. Yes. <laughs> um, and we're so excited to delve into this topic. But before we get started, I just wanted to point out to all our attendees who are watching live with us. Um, after our little interview session with Brian, we will be opening up the platform for opportunities to submit questions. So if you have any questions that you'd like to ask Brian, please feel free to enter those questions through the question pane of your control panel. Um, I will be getting those questions live and we'll be asking them to Brian in our Q&A period. So feel free to submit those at any time during the presentation. Again, you can do that through the questions pane of your control panel. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. All right. Um, Brian, it's, you know, we've had you on Eating Disorder Hope and Addiction Hope, and you have such an incredible story about your recovery from an eating disorder, body dysmorphic disorder, and addiction, and your journey and your story is just so incredibly inspiring. Thank you. Um, for those of us who are, or for those who are joining us who may not know your background or your story or your journey, can you maybe share a little bit with us about your story? Sure, absolutely. Well, I am in recovery from cocaine and alcohol. Uh, I am also in recovery from bulimia. Uh, I am also in recovery from body dysmorphic disorder. And what body dysmorphic disorder is is basically when you take a small or non-existent defect in your body and you exaggerate it to the point where it affects your ability to function quote unquote normally in life. Mm -hmm. So people get a lot of plastic surgery, people do these different things uh, and it affect and it can have a very negative effect on your life. It affects two, about 2% 2 of the population, men and women equally. Mm -hmm. And so, but the addicted lawyer is more about my struggles with alcohol and drugs. Mm -hmm. And again, I have been in recovery from both of those since April 8th, 2017. Mm -hmm. uh, so I just had 10 years going back to April. Congratulations. And, uh, thank you. And of course the book is about how uh, addiction, not only my story, but addiction in the legal profession and in law school, because addicted law, addicted law students can become uh, addicted lawyers. And awesome. there are very high rates of mental health issues in both the legal profession and in law school. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to write a book about that and I was very happy to finally get it out to the public. It was uh, three years in the process. And I was very lucky because right about the time I finished writing it, the groundbreaking study uh, put out there by uh, Betty Ford Hazelton in the American Bar Association, written by Patrick Krill, came out documenting what I had seen anecdotally in my life within the legal profession and the, in, the, in law school, and basically verifying that we have a problem. That is incredible. What crazy timing. Yes. <laughs> and con yes. congratulations again on your book. And this is your second book, right? Your first book was Shattered Image, Your Triumph Over Body Dysmorphic Disorder. Correct. Shattered Image was more about body image and my recovery from bulimia and body dysmorphic disorder. Mm -hmm. Shattered Image is much different than, well, there's a little overlap. Shattered Image is different than The Addicted Lawyer, again, because The Addicted Lawyer is more about addiction. Shattered Image does not really focus that much on my life as a law student and career as a lawyer. It's mm -hmm. a lot more into my childhood, mm -hmm. the things in my childhood that affected my life as an adult in terms mm -hmm. of mental health issues. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that, and um, and and I did. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that. But yes, you are. Are you actively practicing law at this time? I do not practice okay. law. Okay. Uh, people within the legal profession or who are watching or bar associations are probably wondering. I haven't been disbarred, and my license hasn't been suspended. But I'll tell you what, it wasn't for a lack of trying. Mm. <laughs> so <laughs> I did a lot of things as a practicing lawyer that. Uh, were meant to fund my drug habit that were not mm. things lawyers should do. Mm. And 
you know, the, the book that you wrote, you said, really delves into that. Can you take us back into that journey a little bit and how, you know, that overlap started for you between being sure. in law school and dealing with a drug addiction? Sure. Well, we have to go back to Penn State University. I, w I was a, when I was a freshman at Penn State in 1979. Yeah, I'm an I know baby boomer, old man, and <laughs> uh, as a result of many different environmental issues, issues at home, a lot of bullying uh, over my weight, all these things came together, and I developed uh, anorexia and then bulimia as a freshman at Penn State. And of course, back then, nobody was talking about eating disorders at all, let alone for men. And into my sophomore year, I trans transitioned to alcohol and to problem drinking. And by, by the time of my sophomore year at Penn State University, I was a full-blown alcoholic. And this was at a time when you were either in 12-step, you were in a hospital, or you weren't in recovery. We really didn't have all the options we have today. We really we didn't have the awareness we have today. Residential residential treatment really wasn't a thing like mm -hmm. it is today. Right. And so and plus you're a student on a college campus where everyone's drinking. So it's it's very easy to tell yourself that you fit right in and to keep redefining your normal so it doesn't seem like you have an issue. And so that was very important. That's very important to understand because those issues that I faced at Penn State, the eating disorders, I was also exercise bulimic, which is compulsive exercise for the purpose of offsetting calories. Mm -hmm. So I was dealing with all these mental health issues, and I really had no vision of my future other than surviving day to day. I mm -hmm. drank all the time. I ran all the time. There were some days I was so dehydrated from all these things I couldn't get out of bed, and I had arrhythmia. I was very lucky I didn't have a stroke. So as you might imagine, thoughts of law school were not really on my mind at that time. Right. But what was on my mind was that I really didn't want to have to go out into the real world and let people see how what I saw in the mirror, which was this monster who was unloved, mm. who would never get married, who would never go on a date, who was fat and ugly. These are the things I saw in the mirror as a result of body dysmorphic disorder. Right. Uh, so I was terrified to go out in the real world. One day, my senior year at Penn State, and I did pretty well because I had the ability to really just pull it together for a night, pull an all-nighter, and do well the next day on the test. Short-term yeah. memory. I had a good right. short-term memory. <laughs> so I'm sitting in my placement office, and I wanted to be a police officer. That would have worked out well, oh, right? Wow. <laughs> that would have worked out really well. I wanted to be a police officer, so I'm sitting in the placement office looking at the different police jobs and law enforcement jobs, and there were two guys sitting in there talking about taking the law school admission exam. And mm -hmm. I'm listening to them, and they're from the Pittsburgh area. They're talking about applying to the University of Pittsburgh. And the bells started going off in my head. The wheels started turning, and I was thinking to myself, that sounds like a pretty good idea. Not because I wanted to be a lawyer. I did not want to be a lawyer. It sounded like a good idea because it would allow me to be in school for three more years where I could binge and purge, I could drink, mm. I could run 20 miles a day, and I didn't have to tell anyone about it like Penn State. Mm. I saw law school as simply repeating the cycle of survival. Mm. So I didn't want to be Clarence Darrow. I didn't want to change the world. I didn't want to make a lot of money. I wanted to just live the same way I lived at Penn State, not have to go out in the real world and face what I thought I saw in the mirror, which wasn't what everyone else saw, but what is what right. I projected they saw. Exactly. That is the sole reason I went to the University of Pittsburgh School of Law. If you're thinking yeah. of going to law school, don't go for those reasons. Go for yeah. Reasons. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. So once you got into law school, take us from there. What what happened? Sure. How did that environment maybe so further? I took fuel? the law school admission test, and I Pitt was Pitt was one of my choices, and I got into Pitt. And I, since I did wanted to stay close to home, because I really was terrified of going mm -hmm. out anywhere outside of my safety zone because of all my mental health issues. Right. Uh, I, I accepted my admission to Pitt and I remember it like it was yesterday. The first day at Pitt Law, 1L, first year for people who don't know what that is, 1L orientation. I walk in the front door, I look around, all these people catching up with each other, chatting. I can see cliques forming, cliques that had already mm -hmm. formed from people who knew each other undergrad or outside of law school. 
and in my mind, everyone was looking at me saying, that's a fat, ugly pig who will never fit in here. What is he doing here? Mm -hmm. And I, wa I looked at those people and I immediately shut down and decided that I was going to live exactly as I lived at Penn State. I wasn't going to interact with people. I was going to run. I would, you know, I would, was drinking. And that's how I would get through law school. Mm -hmm. I looked right there was my vision of the next three years at Pitt Law. Just the destructive behaviors that I engaged in at Penn State. Not a good recipe for success. Not a good vision right. of your future. And well, that mindset certainly would be unique in terms of the mental health issues I was going through walking through those doors. There may be, there are certainly, I'm certainly not the only law student to walk through the doors of Pitt Law with underlying mental health issues right. that he brought to the game. I call it bringing the baggage to the game, right? Yeah. That happens. Everyone mm -hmm. brings their baggage through the front door, exactly. whatever that is. Mm -hmm. But it's not unique for law students to walk in the front door and feel overwhelmed, feel scared. Am I mm -hmm. going to do well? Am I going to fit in? What's my study group going to be? Am I going to get a job? How, are, how, is my future, how is this going to shape my future? The difference between that and me is I had no vision of that future. Hmm. My vision walking through that door is how can I survive today with all these people who I projected out that hated my guts and wanted nothing to do with me. Right. And that's what my mental health issues were telling me. Hmm. That was my first impression of law school walking through the doors of Pitt Law. Wow. And oh, walking through the doors of Pitt Law at that time, again, this was 1983. Mm -hmm. We weren't talking about counseling. We weren't talking right. about being vulnerable and opening up. We weren't talking about going to the dean of students and letting him know that you're having issues. Exactly. This was the time where mental health was kept to yourself. Hmm. So at what point were you able to realize that you needed help? And that how were you able to connect? Much, that didn't come till much later. The, the close, much later in my life. The mm -hmm. closest I came to self-awareness of my drinking issue. I never had a self-awareness of the eating disorder because I didn't know what an eating disorder was back then. Mm -hmm. It was just an act that was something shameful. And it's still very, it's, it's probably even more stigmatized for lawyers and law students than drinking. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's a very stigmatized issue. Right. Uh, so that really wasn't, you know, for me, the closest I came to self-awareness was walking into a hamburger joint, I was drunk of course, mm. after class, and there was a rack of pamphlets put out by the 12-step organization, the biggest one is AA. Mm. There are other types, but the biggest one is AA. And they put out what's called the 20 questions. Answer this many of these 20 questions and you just might be an alcoholic. And mm. they tailor them for students. You know, they have different types right. of 20 question pamphlets. These were tailored for students. Are you missing class? Yes. Are you blacking out? Yes, yes, yes. Crumple it up, throw it in the garbage. I'm just a college student. I don't have a problem. That was as close as it came back then. Mm. I wasn't aware of any other people who had drinking issues. I wasn't really aware of people who might have been in 12-step. We didn't have back then legal assistance programs that included law students like we do today. Back then, we didn't have legal assistance programs. We may have had, you know, quiet, stigmatized groups of students and lawyers helping each other. Right. And, and like today, we have lawyers helping lawyers in a bunch of different states. But uh, there was really no one for me to turn to, even if I thought I had a problem. I wouldn't have known mm. what to do back mm. then. This was a very different era. I did not realize I had a problem uh, until probably my when I became suicidal in 2005, mm. when my brothers took me on my first trip to a, a local psychiatric facility. But even then, I wasn't ready for recovery. And by that point, I had lost all my clients as a lawyer because of my drug use. I went from making six figures uh, as a lawyer to having no clients. Mm -hmm. And I had spent all my money on my, on my drugs and alcohol. And drug addiction will do that. Alcoholism will do that. And so it was in April of, uh, I really, I didn't go in, I really didn't have that aha moment until my second trip to a psychiatric facility after a drug and alcohol induced blackout and where I really, really realized that there wasn't going to be a third trip because I'd be dead. Mm -hmm. And I was really at the point of losing everything. Mm 
family, okay. everything. Mm. So that was really my turning point, mm. and that was April 2007. So how was it as a practicing lawyer while you were struggling with this, and how did that continue to fuel the addiction for you? The, st the stress of the stress of practicing law certainly had had an, an effect because I the, there was a stress of I really was doing something I didn't want to do. Mm. There was a str there were different types of stressors. The stress of doing something I didn't want to do, the stress of continuing to fund a lifestyle that I created to myself, created for myself, the stress of doing work that clients ex like, so you get more. And what happens, and I see this all the time with lawyers and law students who are dealing with substance use issues, alcohol, and aren't really aren't ready to face it, and they tell themselves they're high functioning. Mm -hmm. The hardest thing I have, the hardest conversation to have is getting them to understand this is as good as it's going to get today mm -hmm. because it's progressive. You think you're high functioning today, but when I went and talked to people who observed me back then, yeah. I was telling myself I was high functioning, even though I call it the Peter Principle of Recovery. Mm -hmm. As my level of competence was reduced and reduced and reduced because of my drug and alcohol use, I kept adjusting my new normal to tell myself I was kicking butt. Right. Right. But, right. And so the, the decrease in the decrease in our ability to function and our ability to perform is at first if you're high functioning slowly, and then eventually it drops off a cliff. Exactly. But, but you keep telling yourself you're doing okay because there are no consequences. Mm. And I run into this all the time with lawyers and law students. Law students, until that test comes, they may not understand that their performance is slipping, that they're not studying as hard, they're not retaining as much. Uh, so, but law students have different fears too. They are afraid of, you know, one day they are afraid of being ostracized. They're afraid of going to the dean of students, they're afraid of having to leave law school. They mm. don't never make it back. And I know plenty of law students who have left law school, dealt with their mental health issues, and gone back to law school. Wow. So that is not always the case. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it is, and sometimes you don't have to do that. Now right. for lawyers, it's a, it's a different type of thing. Lawyers, again, they may be high functioning, there are no consequences. Lawyers, and a lot of it becomes about vulnerability. Lawyers have a very difficult time allowing themselves to be vulnerable. And as we know, vulnerability is one of the key constants of recovery, any kind of recovery. Absolutely. Because conversations I have with lawyers who, again, may not have any consequences yet are, well, I'm, I'm making money. Nothing's going on at home. I'm billing. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. I ha I'm going to 12-step. I have it under control. I say, well, let's talk about that. Hmm. What was your life like as a child? And I'm not a PhD. I'm not a counselor, right. but I understand, you know, the baggage Just we bring. Your experience, exactly. So what was what was your life like as a child? Tell me about your brother sisters. I don't need to know about your alcohol use because you wouldn't be talking to me if there wasn't a problem with that, exactly. right? Exactly. I want. We know where you are. I want to know how you got there. That is where lawyers have the most difficult time, and law students too. Mm -hmm. Law students. Uh, have a very high degree of problem drinking and depression and anxiety. There was a very good study done by David Jaffe at the American mm. University School of Law in D.C. that came out not long ago that mm. found a very high rate of problem drinking, anxiety, and depression among law students. And I would encourage mm. any law student or dean of students interested in reading that study, like I would encourage them also to read the ABA Hazleton study, as I would encourage right. any lawyer to read that. Right. So... So, so it's lawyers have different concerns than law students, but there's a problem. But stress, vulnerability, mm -hmm. recreating our new normal—they mm -hmm. all play out the same, just in a different environment. Exactly. And as you, you know, were in your own recovery and looking back retrospectively, what what began to help you understand that this was a greater problem or a more common issue um, among law students and lawyers? As I got into sobriety, I started really reflecting on my journey mm -hmm. because I had never really reflected on the law school and the law and the lawyer journey because I was ashamed. Yeah. I was ashamed of the things I did as a lawyer. Uh, sure. I was the consummate quote-unquote ambulance chaser. I used to 
I, I used to take a briefcase with contracts down a, a chiropractor's office and sit there mm -hmm. waiting for the chiropractor to bring out somebody who was in an auto accident and say, hey, Brian, this is Brian Cuban, our lawyer. I was, a, I was the, con, the stereotypical ambulance chaser. And mm -hmm. these were the things I did to fund my drug habit. I mean, I didn't do... I didn't give my clients my best. How can you when you're hungover all the time or doing cocaine in the bathroom in your law firm? Mm -hmm. So in a sense, I was stealing from my clients because mm -hmm. they're paying an hourly rate and you're not giving them your best work, right? Exactly. That is a form of stealing. Yeah. And so as a law student, you're robbing yourself because you are not performing at the level you could perform because you're not dealing with these mental health issues. Exactly. I look at back at those days, and I don't believe in revisionist recovery saying yeah. if I had done this, this would be different. But how can I not say if I wasn't in a different mindset, if I wasn't getting counseling, if I wasn't in 12-step, if I wasn't you know, stringing together recovery as a law student, that I would not have performed better. That's just, that may be anecdotal, but it's also common sense, right? Exactly, yeah, to be reflective. That's right. So I, ha I reflected like that, and I decided that there was a story to tell, and I started stringing together stories. And Part of what I do is remembering, right? A lot of people don't want to remember. Everything I do is revolved around remembering the things we try to forget and the things we bury. So it took me a long time to start thinking about these things in law school, my feelings in law school, breaking mm -hmm. down different moments in law school in a snapshot, into snapshots, mm -hmm. and thinking about how I felt in that moment. Mm -hmm. It's the life of a writer. Absolutely. You learn, you learn how to do that. And... Once I was able to put that all together, I really felt there was a message for both law students and lawyers that mm. you don't have to follow this path. Mm. That the, the path today has many more ways to branch out into recovery versus the path than when I was going through. But we have to fight through our own shame, our own barriers, our own inability to be vulnerable because the first step stops, the first step has to be with us, right? Absolutely. Addi addiction, addiction isn't a choice. Recovery is. Yes, I love that. That's I firmly Whether believe Whether you're a law well. student or yes. a lawyer or just Joe out in the street. Absolutely. And, you know, I just, your message is so refreshing, and I love that you really focus on this facet of um, the addiction community because I think it's easy to overlook people who are high-functioning, you know, like you were saying. And I'm curious, as you, as your book's been released and as you've been um, more open in discussing this, what platform has this opened up and what have you been surprised about in terms of uh, people and the conversation that's been started? I mean, it, it's opened up a big platform. I mean, this is, I really, there, there, there's one other book, a wonderful book written by Lisa Smith out there uh, that's a, me a pure memoir, but this is literally the first book of this type to be written ever. Mm -hmm. A book that is not only memoir about a lawyer in recovery, right. but also is prescriptive because it has uh, it has contributions from other law students in recovery, dealing mm. with everything from heroin to alcohol, other lawyers in recovery, lawyers who have gone back and practiced, and lawyers because of things they did well deep in addiction or have lost their license, but have redefined their lives and are very mm. happy. Hence mm. the word redemption. Exactly. Redemption doesn't have to be going back to the practice of law. Sometimes there are consequences that prevent us from going back. Lawyers lose their license, lawyers are suspended, and you have to do other things, not always. So I wanted the book to be about hope. And mm -hmm. it's a profession that if you look at the statistics, needs hope. Yeah. It needs just addiction hope, it needs hope. When we see that 21 to 36% of practicing lawyers qualify under alcohol use disorder. I mean, mm. alcoholism, problem drinking. 21 to 36 percent. That is a profession in crisis. The mm. greatest at risk, the greatest demographic at risk are lawyers under 10 years, are millennials, are right. growing, you know, our, our next generation coming up are at the greatest risk. And then I look and I see bar associations on Twitter and in, in social media, marketing happy hours. I see young lawyers marketing happy hours. Law schools, happy hours. It's a drinking culture. Mm. And this drinking culture has taught law students and lawyers we have been culturalized to turn to drinking when we are faced with stress. 
Hmm. It's a systematic issue from top down, law firm to law school, mm -hmm. that has to be addressed. Absolutely. And, and we're doing better. It, it was slowly, we're doing better. We are. But just the other day, I saw a bar association, and I'm not going to call them out. You know, uh, I, they put out some, it's called a MEM, M E M E. Or, uh, yeah, or it's about Wednesday happy hour. Ha it's what, happy hour? It's Wednesday. Oh, my goodness. I mean, and, and, we're, and we're inviting lawyers to the happy hour. Can we do something else besides happy hours? I know yeah. it's a draw, but, the, you know, we. For things to change, we have to break away with from this, and bar, mm. bar associations have to get involved. Mm. Lawyers' assistance programs have to get involved. Mm -hmm. Every state has a lawyer's assistance program there to help lawyers. Lawyers don't trust them. Lawyers don't trust lawyers' assistance programs because they think it's going to get out, even, mm. though, the, even though the communications are protected by statute. Mm. Lawyers' assistance programs are underfunded, so it's hard for them to get into law firms and make these big push. Mm. I, I just keynoted the Texas State Bar Convention. Oh, wow. I love our lawyers assistance program. I love them to death. They're doing great work with what they have. We didn't even have, they, they had some pamphlets at a table. They didn't even have a strong presence. And, and I'm not blaming, it, it's just part of the overall systemic problem. Right, exactly. And what an opportunity that your book is opening up this conversation and shining light on so many issues, like you said, from law school all the way up to and practicing I, lawyers. And I felt it was important enough that at my expense, I sent my book to every bar association in the country. Oh. If you're watching you get one, let me know. Over 250 of them, because I think a couple of them were bad addresses. <laughs> but I, did, I, sent, I sent this book to every bar association in the country. Are we still there? There we are. <laughs> I don't that. think <laughs> Okay. So, yeah, so every bar and association got, got the book. Every legal assistance program in the country, I sent them the book uh, for free because I want them. I, I when, when in desperate times, you have to take desperate measures to create awareness. And if people aren't aware, I'm going to put it in front of them. So uh, we keep losing. We keep losing you. Well, I'll keep talking. So that is, you know, that's what I've been doing, and. Again, it is a systemic issue that I don't know what happened here, whether we've lost, uh, if we're still recording here. Okay. I am here. Sorry What's about going that. What's going on? So, <laughs> okay. My connection. Okay. I'm so sorry. Okay. Yes. Well, it, again, it's a systemic issue that we all have to take apart. Bar associations have to take apart. Legal assistance programs have to take apart. Take apart. Do you love, in every law school, does every law student know, uh, I mean, a lot, in a lot of states, I don't know, think it's in every state, but in a lot of states, legal assistance programs also help law students. So in law schools, are, requ are, requ are, requ are creating a continuum of possible recovery from the law, from the law student to the dean of students, to a counseling, to the on-campus counseling, if it's part of a larger university, to the legal assistance programs, to other programs out there. And the same thing within the uh, legal community, we have to create the same continuum of recovery. But it's, it's not happening as fast as I'd like, but it's happening. I can't hear you. Sorry. <laughs> I'm just saying that it's so inspiring to see that you're using this as part of your advocacy work, you know, and obviously creating change in something like this where there are so many systematic issues. It's going to happen gradually, but you're making it happen little by little. Well, let's just take it from the law firm standpoint. Yeah. I mean, we have to, they're, they're just the simplest things we can do. Are we putting it out there to the lawyers? Are the legal, you know, the are we putting the literature out there and making sure all lawyers are aware of what's going on in the recovery community if there are issues? Are we at least having meeting a meeting once a year within the firm on recovery issues? I mean, this is important on mental health issues, just not recovery, mental health issues, to make sure the firm is doing everything it can do because it all starts with people. You can't just wait say someone else is going to do it. It all starts with people. I was very troubled by an article in the Wall Street Journal. 
Hmm. Uh, that was, again, it featured Patrick Krill again, that talked about how some law firms are bringing in counselors to talk to their lawyers, you know, for their lawyers in case they need them. And a couple, and I think it was a managing partner at another law firm, I'm not going to use their name, but said, we're not going to do that because we don't want people to think our lawyers are crazy. Yikes. Are you telling me, are, <laughs> so that you're in denial, you're, you're billing yeah. over mental health. That's a systemic issue. And then it further stigmatizes That's right. the addiction problem. If you bring it out of the law firms into the solo practitioner in the small firm, we so saw social isolation is a real problem. Yeah. How are the bar associations reaching out to those people to battle the social social isolation? Sit in your office all day working, uh, isolating yourself from connections. These are, these are all these issues the profession has to address. Mm-hmm. And Thank we're starting to. Insight. Yeah, and that's what I mean. It's just what an incredible thing that your book has spurred this conversation and is creating these changes and, and forcing people to look at an issue that has likely been there for a long time. Oh, sure. I mean, if you're in a law firm, if you're an associate or you're a paralegal, you know the issue. You, you, know, if, yeah. you know if your partner or if an associate has an issue. You exactly. see it. You see the missed phone calls. You see the full voicemail. You see the unopened mail. You see the missed hearings. The yeah. question becomes next. I mean, the signs are easy. The signs are not always difficult to spot. Right. What to do next? Exactly. Because who wants to be the one to tell a partner who's making a lot of money for them? You're an associate or paralegal. I'm not saying you should do that, but there's a fear. Hmm. There's a fear and a stigma. Who wants to be the person to take that first step and say there's a problem? Hmm. It's very difficult. And this is where law firms need to really coalesce in how they deal with these things and have, say, even a committee, a mental health committee that says, okay, this is the person that is going to be front line. This is the person we go to. This is the person who's going to approach someone. These are the resources we have. You know, in addition to the employee assistance program the law firm exactly. may have. Mm -hmm. So there are ways to address it. You just have to want to do it. And then you Absolutely. have to do it. Absolutely. And Brian, I'm curious too for, you know, any law student who may be watching this, either now who's joining us or watching the recording in the future, what are your words of advice or encouragement? You know, and you you were so gracious to share your story and what it was like for you as a law student. Um, my what, advice is, yeah, I, what said, I, know you, I know you're afraid. I understand the fears. I understand the fear of dropping out. I understand the fear of bad grades. I understand the fear of stig, be, stig, being stigmatized. I, under, I under, understand the fear of not wanting your professors to know. This is a different era from when I was in law school. Talk to your, allow yourself to be helped. This is as good as it's ever going to get right now. Hmm. Reach out to your dean of students. If you're, you dean, the deans of students, the assistant deans of students, they understand these issues nowadays. They, they are there to help you. Talk to them. It's confidential. Reach out mm -hmm. to them. Mm -hmm. Reach out to a fellow student. I mean, there are students in recovery at every school, I guarantee you. Just look at the demographics. Every law school class has somebody in recovery. Yeah. I have no doubt in my mind. Yeah. I don't have a survey to put that behind it's an, that's just an assumption but I feel good about that yeah find the other students in recovery talk to them if you're uncomfortable with that go to and you're on a bigger campus and your law school is part of a larger campus does the university have a student students in recovery go to them go to their counseling mm -hmm. but you have to take that first step and I say it again it is as good as it's going to get right now mm -hmm. because substance use alcohol and even clinical depression, it is step, 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 step down. Now catch it now and get it stabilized, then step, 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 step up. That's my advice. Thank you so much for because sharing Because I've that. been there. Yeah, exactly. And that's why I think it's so meaningful to come from you. Um, and Brian, before we start moving into our Q&A period um, with our attendees who are joining us live, um, I'm just curious, you know, what do you think was most instrumental in helping you in your recovery? And you know, it, it's so different for everyone in terms of the therapies that are available now. There's 12-step groups. There's yes. other different kinds. I can, only, I can only speak to my recovery, and I put the mm -hmm. disclaimer that this is not a 
ad for any particular type of recovery. I believe right. every person is different. I personally got sober in 12 step. Okay. Ten years ago, that is all I knew. Mm -hmm. That was all that was offered to me. I was not aware of smart recovery. Mm -hmm. uh, I was not aware of all the different options. But I also, uh, I also took part in a lot of therapy. I see a psychiatrist once a week. I still do. Mm -hmm. I also got on antidepressants to deal with my uh, clinical depression. Mm -hmm. So I was. There were several different modalities to my recovery. You have, it all starts with talking to someone, whether it's a professional or a friend, and go through there, explore the options that are available. If, mm -hmm. if, if it's 12-step, then it's 12-step. Maybe it's smart recovery, which is non-12-step based. There, are, there, are, there is non-12-step based recovery. There's Christian-based recovery, Christian-based 12-step. Mm -hmm. There is behavior modification recovery. There are all kinds of avenues out there today for somebody for the, you know, to pick what suits you as a person. Exactly. But there's always, there's also always an excuse not to do it. That's a good point. You know, I think the resources are there. I think it's just about being able to take that first step and connect. Absolutely. You the first step. Something. You got to yeah. jump. You got to yeah. jump. Yeah. Absolutely. Jumping is scary. Yeah. <laughs> Stepping into the unknown is scary. It but is. I'll tell you, what gets really scary is when you, you know, when you really, when it really starts going like this. Yeah. Well, Brian, we so appreciate you sharing your story, and I just love hearing your passion for the subject and to hear the advocacy work that you're doing. I mean, you're doing such important work for the community. So we so Thank appreciate you. you sharing. Thank you. Thank you. And um, just to our attendees, um, we are opening up for a Q&A right now with Brian. So if you have a question that you would like to ask him live, please feel free to go ahead and submit it through the question pane of your control panel. And we do have a couple questions that have come through, Brian. So if it's okay, I'll go ahead and All share right. it with you. Um, one of our attendees is asking, what would you like to see changed in law schools to better support students with mental health? I would like to see direct relationships that with the uh, mental health community that are directly pipelined to the students with uh, with actual maybe even a mental health uh, class, you know, a mental health day mm. where we have where the students are actually aware of the pipeline and made aware at times other than just one L orientation. I would mm. like to see that. I would like to see all deans of students have relationships with the mental health facilities and be aware of all the, and they may be, but these mm -hmm. are just, this is just my wish list. Mm -hmm. Law schools need to get better with one, empowering students to come forward. And so that I think falls on the deans of students mm -hmm. and the dean to figure out how to do that more than just, hey, here's the, uh, here's some pamphlets at the beginning of the year. Exactly. Okay. Because not all the problems that walk through the door are the same pro at the beginning of the year are the same problems the next day or the next day or the next day. How are we empowering that pipeline of recovery day in and day out? Mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm, I, law schools don't have to become counseling clinics. Exactly. But they can do really basic things to make sure students are repetitively made aware of the resources that are available and mm -hmm. make it user friendly for them mm -hmm. to take advantage of those resources. I think that would be a great start. I think that so too. A That's a great point. I love that. Thank you for your insight on that. Um, another one of our attendees is wondering if you sought treatment for both the eating disorder and addiction at the same time. Yes, I did. Okay. Okay. I, uh, I underwent uh, a lot of cognitive behavioral therapy, and mm -hmm. a lot of acceptance and commitment therapy which are specific mm -hmm. therapies for uh, eating disorders and a body dysmorphic disorder that I was dealing mm -hmm. with. So yes, my, uh, I did not go to residential treatment. I got sober purely in 12 step, but a lot of the therapy for my deal with my eating disorder also uh, was very beneficial for my substance use disorder. Mm -hmm. And just, I'm kind of just piggybacking on this too. Um, but is that something that you've observed just in your research and in writing this book? Is that co-occurring disorders, you know, with not necessarily 50%. an eating disorder, yeah, but just yeah, those... I mean, there's a, there's a fifty percent co-occurring correlation between eating disorders and substance use disorder. Mm. So, so it's usually more than just the addiction itself. It could be you know a mood it disorder. Could be, I mean, 
I mean, there's depression. I mean, depression often goes hand in hand. Again, what I encourage people, what I encourage law students, what I encourage lawyers is, okay, we can get sober, right? We can we can string yeah. together sobriety. We can deal with how we got there. We can take the medication. We get in counseling. But are you willing to pare back all the layers of your life and mm. figure out, you know, whatever that may be, and figure out how you got there? Mm. Such a good point. Okay, another question here let's see, from one of our attendees are, is wondering, what is the likelihood of a lawyer being able to go back to practicing law after treatment? That's a great question. It dep after, well, after treatment, uh, you can go to, it, I don't know if the question is in, in the structure of a lawyer being disciplined or not. I mean, if you haven't been disciplined, you can, uh, it, you can go to treatment, go back, and go back to the practice of law. So yes, they said, um, it's being disciplined for substance abuse. Okay, it just mm -hmm. depends on uh, what you've done. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you know if if you again, it's going to depend on the severity of what you've done. If you, if, if 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 during the course of your addiction, your substance use disorder, you stole a client's money, you're probably not going to be allowed to practice law again. And I don't think mm -hmm. there's a road back from that. You're going to have to redefine your life and mm -hmm. redefine your career, and you can. And mm -hmm. you can, uh, because you've got to remember the state bar's job is to protect the public. Mm. Okay, so that's that's usually a non-negotiable thing if you've stolen money, if you've misappropriated mm. funds, even if mm. you have an addiction issue. But uh, if 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 you if there's an addiction issue, if you come forward, you know, and you go through the process of the legal assistance program, whatever the agreement is to get you back on track, sure. You, you can go back to practicing law. It just depends on what you've done. It depends on what the discipline is. It depends on what the agreement is with the uh, with the bar and the legal assistance program. Sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know plenty of lawyers who have been uh, disciplined, uh, who have gotten DWIs and gone through all the different things and gone back to practicing law. But, yeah, if, if there are things that you can do that it's just not going to happen, and I think most yeah. lawyers know that. Sure. I know Lord, I have a very good friend who's went to prison uh, for uh, Chris Paulus, went to prison for a drug offense, spent just over three years in federal prison, was pardoned by President mm -hmm. Obama, did wow. all the different things. He actually got clearance at the White House. He was a White House intern. And he wow. proved to the bar examiners in Maine that he was of good moral character once again. And he just was sworn in two days or two or three days ago. Oh my goodness! As a practicing lawyer, so it is possible. It's Every situation is going to be different, yeah. but you, it does happen. You can, you can go through discipline. You can go through a, you know, treatment and make it back as a practicing lawyer and and mm. and, and, and excel. Mm. Thank you, Brian. And I think this is kind of following up to that um, first question, but how can of someone who's now in sobriety deal with the culture you speak of in like the, the culture of um, let me read this. So being in a culture of alcoholism or when alcohol like you were speaking of happy hours and um, things like that. So for a lawyer who may be sober and in sobriety and who's now coming back and in this culture, how would you encourage them to maybe deal with some it of those is on us, It is on us in recovery because recovery is our choice, right? It is on us as hard as it is, it is on us to redefine those connections until mm -hmm. we are comfortable with being back in that environment, if ever. Mm -hmm. uh, even as a lawyer, you have to decide because you have to decide what's more important, okay? Mm -hmm. The culture or your sobriety. Hmm. For me, it was my sobriety because without my sobriety, I had nothing else, right? Hmm. So, from my standpoint, sobriety has to become before everything, even you know, schmoozing at work. Yes. So it is, it is incumbent upon us to change those connections. There are hmm. plenty of lawyers who are not in recovery who don't drink. Hmm. Now, but when, when we are in the culture and we're doing this, we're going to the happy hours. It may seem like there are not, but there are. It is upon mm. us to reach out and find those communities. Mm. Uh, lawyers helping lawyers. Get into those recovery communities. Does mm. your community have a lawyers helping lawyers? Dallas does. 12-step uh, communities have lawyers. You know, There are lawyers in the 12-step communities. There is a legal community of sober people 
that you, we can you can take advantage of. You just have to you know you just have to get out there and make yourself part of it. Sure. The question is, do you want to? Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and another question here is, how can I become involved in advocacy work for changing some of the dynamics of the current lawyer culture? Email me at brian at briancuban.com or brian at addictedlawyer.com with an I, and I'll help you get started. Great. I'm going to put that in here in the chat. And Brian, tell us a little bit more about your book and where we can find it and where we can order yeah, here, it. Here's my book. Okay, now I now I get to pander to my book. Here's my book, <laughs> The Addicted Lawyer. Yay. Uh, my, my brother Mark was nice enough to put a quote there. Yes, I'm not above pandering to that either. <laughs> <laughs> so it is available on Amazon.com. Uh, it is uh, just Google the put the addicted yes, lawyer. Gonna, my name. Brian I'm gonna put the link in the chat for everyone to the. Amazon. And it is also available at BarnesandNoble.com, and you might find it in some Barnes and Noble bookstores. And on Kindle, I see too. Yes, it's available on Kindle, and I think Nook too. So, but yep, there it is. Tales Wonderful. of the Bars, Booze, Blow, and Redemption. Thank you. And we are, Brian has so graciously offered to give away one of his books to one this of our This is it, right here. I'm giving this one. I'm giving yeah, this one away. so we will be choosing um, one of our attendees at random, and we'll be sure to email you and okay. so you can get your contact okay. information. And over also, to once again, if you have any questions that weren't answered here, just email me, brian at briancuban.com or brian at addictedlawyer.com with brian with an I. Wonderful. Because you only and have an hour, you can't cover every specific. I know, and we have, I did put Brian's email address and the link to his book on Amazon in the chat for our attendees who are with us live if you want to go ahead and check I have to out. talk, in a, one, in a one hour webinar I have to talk in more broad, broad sweeps, yeah. but if you want specifics of things I think we can be doing, the nitty gritty, feel free to email me. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Brian. And just if you can maybe share a little bit about your journey writing this book. You know, you said it was a three-year journey, and I'm sure it was it, a lot emotionally just kind of looking back I in mean, that phase of your life. I think any time you write a book like this, it's an emotional journey. I mean, the first book I wrote was an emotional journey. Yeah. They're always a healing journey when you're recovering new, recovering new ground, trying to cover and find new messages for, you know, that people can... Uh, people can grab onto that may help them. Mm -hmm. That brings up a lot of pain. Writing brings up a lot of pain. It brings up a lot of emotion. Mm -hmm. And putting it on paper is very cathartic. Mm -hmm. That's another thing I think is very important. Expressive writing. Start writing. Mm -hmm. you know, start writing about what's bothering you. Start writing about your pain. Get it on paper. Let it sit for a, a couple days. Go back and look at it. What do you see? Mm -hmm. What message do you see? It's mm -hmm. been it, it's been a great journey, and I was very happy when it was finally over and the book got out. Yeah. And now the next part is continuing. Uh, Absolutely. I, you know, the speaking. I, I have a lot of bar associations that have reached out to me. Uh, again, I just keynoted the Texas State Bar Convention, so I'm very happy spreading my message because whether you're talking to one person or a hundred people, as long as one person says, "Okay, today's the day. I'm gonna I'm gonna give it a try." Absolutely. That's all I can hope for. One person, it. one life. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, if if anyone is interested in kind of following your journey and or or hearing you speak, is there somewhere that we can keep up with you, you can <laughs> in keep that up regard? With you. Uh, B Cuban on Twitter. Okay. I'll and then you can connect with me on LinkedIn. You can connect with me on LinkedIn or Facebook. Uh, mm -hmm. I use Facebook. You know, people can. A lot of people follow me on Facebook. I use Facebook not so much in a personal sense, much more like I use Twitter, mm -hmm. where I have a lot of people that follow me and I post a lot of recovery content, post of stuff about law school and lawyers, so you can follow me there as well. Great. Thank you so much. And just kind of as we conclude our webinar together, if you could share what are your hopes for you know, the future of lawyers who are struggling with this problematic issue, like you said, when those studies came out, it just confirmed the anecdotal evidence that you already kind of pulled together. Well, obviously, my, my, my hope is that that number comes down substantially over the, you know, over the, what probably be the near long term. Uh, it doesn't happen overnight. Systemic issues don't, uh, don't resolve themselves overnight. Mm -hmm. And my hope is that the next time this study comes out, we have more people answering because they weren't mm -hmm. afraid to answer. Yeah. And that we have more people who are talking about getting help. We have legal assistance programs that are better funded. Mm -hmm. We have 
continuing education. I, the ABA recommended it. My hope is that soon we have continuing education on substance use and mental health mandated in every state mm -hmm. for everyone. Uh, so those are my hopes. Wonderful. Well, we are so looking forward to seeing where this book takes you and the rest of your journey. And thank you again for being thank so open open and genuine about your story and um, seeing everything that you've been through and your your redemption is incredibly inspiring. So we really appreciate you being here and being willing to share. Thanks for having me. Look forward to doing it again. Thank you so much, Brian. And again, to all our attendees who joined us tonight, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Um, I've put several links in the chat box if you're interested in following Brian or learning more about his book. And Brian, is your website still active? Yes, Brian, www.briancuban.com. You can see my speaking gigs there. Okay, perfect. I'll stick that in here too. Great. And then if you're interested oh, in... Oh, wait. I also forgot. Yeah. I write for... I have a column. If you're in the legal professional law school, you're probably familiar with Above the Law. I write about recovery yes. from Above the Law. So I have a column called The Addicted Lawyer on Above the Law. Is that... Um... Oh, it's AboveTheLaw.com? Yes. Wonderful. Okay, I'll stick that in there, too. Thank you. And any other resources? Are you still writing? Um, I think it was Psychology Today. Do you still write? I am not. I switched over okay. my blogs to Above the Law. Perfect. And as far as resources, I mean, the American Bar Association website has listings of all the lawyer's assistance programs. Okay. Uh, the local bar associations are going to have what their lawyer's assistance program are. Okay, great. And... Go to your dean of students and get a listing of the resources that they have. Yeah, that's He's so one, true. He, he, want, he or she wants to talk to you. He or she wants to talk to you. They yeah. are not the ogre. So this true. is a new way. <laughs> they want to talk it's to you. It's so true. And I think sometimes it's just taking that first step, you know, to, to asking for help, sure. which is the hardest. Um, but, yes, thank you for sharing all those great resources. And we also have some... Um, fantastic resources on addictionhope.com, and Brian's contributed so many wonderful pieces to both websites, Eating Disorder Hope and Addiction Hope, if you're interested in reading those. So um, that kind of concludes our webinar for tonight. Thank you so much again, Brian. It's such an honor to have you, and congratulations on your book, and we really look forward to seeing where you go from here. Thanks. I look forward to coming on again. Thanks, Brian, and to all our Take attendees. Care. Thank you for bye -bye. joining us and have a great night. Bye. You too. Bye bye.